Well, good afternoon. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome you to today's event hosted by the R Street Institute, uh, exploring the nexus between data privacy and security. My name is Brandon Pugh. I'm the director of R Street Cybersecurity uh, and Emerging Threats team. Uh, if you're not familiar, the R Street Institute's a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy research organization. Our mission is to engage in policy research and outreach, promote free markets, and limited effective government. Uh, a key focus area of our team is data privacy and security, including the need for a comprehensive federal data privacy and security law. We realize some may see data privacy as only a consumer issue, uh, but we believe there's a strong security nexus as malicious actors can and are exploiting our personal information for nefarious purposes. Um, our event today features a panel of experts to explore this topic, including Jessica Dawson and Sam Kaplan, and moderated by Sam Sabine, uh, or Sabine of, of Axios. Uh, as a disclaimer, all individuals are speaking in their personal capacities, not on behalf of the government or their individual company. But prior to a panel, I'm thrilled to have Eric Goldstein, the Executive Assistant Director for the Cybersecurity, um, or CISA, uh, to, to provide introductory remarks. Eric's going to give us an overview on the current cyber landscape and also note CISA's important role. Then the panel will delve into a specific theme. Eric has been with CISA since 2021, after previous roles with Goldman Sachs, the Department of Homeland Security more broadly, and as an attorney in private practice. So thrilled to have Eric. Thanks, Eric. Hi, folks. I'm Eric Goldstein, head of cybersecurity at CISA. I'm so sorry that I can't be with all of you live today, but I'm so grateful for the chance to join for just a few minutes and perhaps give a bit of perspective, a bit of scene setting on how we're thinking about the evolving cyber threat environment and ways that we can think about the urgent work that needs to be done in the months and even years ahead. And you know, I'm really grateful for groups like R Street bringing together government, industry, academia, civil society to get after these hard problems because we really are facing a fairly extraordinary challenge in cybersecurity. And of course, we know that we need to be grounded in what the adversaries are actually doing and trying to do. We know that we are at risk at times of cybersecurity becoming an abstraction, becoming a theoretical concept that then removes us from the actual harm being done to American organizations, communities, and individuals every day. And of course, we have to start when thinking about the adversary with People's Republic of China cyber threat actors. You know, I'll, I'll start off just by, by pointing everyone's attention to the DNI's Unclassified Annual Threat Assessment, which puts in really stark relief the fact that proximate to a potential future conflict around Taiwan, we expect it's likely that PRC cyber actors would execute destructive attacks against critical infrastructure. And that's really a fundamental change in how we think about cybersecurity risk in this country, which previously for many organizations, many corporations, was founded in theft of intellectual property concerns about espionage. We don't have to be concerned about destructive attacks on the critical infrastructure that underpins all of our ways of life and our daily activities. But of course, we can't stop with our analysis there. We know that Russian cyber actors remain highly capable and with tremendous uncertainty surrounding the future trajectory of cyber activities around uh, the criminal war in Ukraine, we have to remain on heightened alert about how we think about the potential for future Russian cyber activity targeting the US and our allies. And of course, we had the extraordinarily shocking, upsetting, and saddening events uh, in Israel uh, and Gaza over the past uh, several days. And of course, we are on high alert to understand potential cyber threats that may emanate uh, from that conflict, whether targeting Israel or Israel's allies like the United States. And of course, here at CISA, we are standing side by side with our partners at the Israel National Cyber Director to provide any and all support that we can in this tremendously challenging time. It's also the case that the nation state adversaries like China, 
uh, Russia, Iran, are not the only threats that are affecting American organizations. In fact, for most organizations uh, in the U.S., it's criminal groups that are placing our resources, our companies, our information most at risks, in many cases through ransomware intrusions. And so even as we focused on the systemic strategic risk posed by nation states, we also need to keep investing urgently in strategies to disrupt, deter, and add friction to ransomware actors that are still causing far too much harm for organizations across the country. So in this threat, threat environment, when our adversaries are becoming more capable, investing more, and have the intent to do real harm to our country and, and entities therein, what do we do about it? At CISA, we think there's really three key areas where we need to keep focusing, all of which are highly synchronous with the national cybersecurity strategy. The first is an ongoing focus on persistent collaboration, on driving a cultural change where there is a default to share, a default to collaborate, where we are identifying perceived risks to collaboration and tearing them down, and we are showing reciprocal value in collaboration between government and the private sector because at the end of the day, we know that the government is likely not going to be the first um, entity who identifies an emergent risk targeting our country. It's going to be our partners in the private sector. And so the more that we can do to make sure that we are sharing frictionlessly, we are sharing with reciprocal value, that's going to let us get ahead of the threat and drive down risk before harm occurs. At CISA, we've tried to build a forum, a function, a structure around our joint cyber defense collaborative, where we now have over 150 organizations across sectors engaging in persistent collaboration, uh, including uh, even in the last two weeks around the conflict in Israel. Um, and we need to double down on that work to make sure that not only, not only we are deriving value as a community, but we are, we are pushing value for every organization that's participating. The second key effort has to be driving investment in the right security measures that really work. And just this month, CISA announced our new uh, public service campaign called Secure Our World, which really is designed to ensure that every American knows the few small steps they can take to secure uh, their devices, secure their families. But we also know that if the burden is on individuals and families to manage their own security, we're in the wrong place. And so that gets into our third priority, which is driving a culture of security by design across every product, building upon our joint seal uh, product that we released uh, at Singapore International Cyber Week just a few days ago, and leading to a world where the products that we are using every day, whether we're an individual, a small business, or a major corporation, are safe and secure by design and default, and we are creating a world where the most important controls are implemented by design, thereby increasing friction for our adversaries and reducing the prevalence of harm affecting American organizations. So thanks again for the chance to join today uh, for a few remarks. I hope these help to some degree frame the dialogue yet to come. On behalf of CISA, we're looking forward to the conversation and the engagement to come. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, I'm Sam Sabin. I'm the cybersecurity reporter at Axios, and I will be um, your friendly, kind, hopefully not too uh, persistent and rude moderator for today's panel. Uh, thank you so much to R Street for organizing this and also to Eric Goldstein for providing those keynote remarks. Um, before I turn it over to our panelists, let you introduce themselves and, and brag a little bit about their expertise and why they're here. Uh, I wanted to give you guys a reminder that we will be taking audience Q&A. It won't just be me asking the questions here today. So if there's anything throughout the conversation that sparks your curiosity. Uh, there should be a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to drop it in. I can see all that. Uh, and I'll, I'll be sure to kind of feed those questions in at the end. Uh, but I guess to start, uh, we can go around and kind of have our, our panelists introduce themselves. Um, I know Brandon already uh, did that a little bit here. Uh, so maybe I could toss it to my friendly other Sam on the line to, to kick us off. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, Sam. Uh, first and foremost, uh, as Brendan mentioned, my participation here, again, is in my personal capacity, and uh, none of the views or the opinions of Palo Alto Networks or, or uh, the positions of the company. Second, and most importantly, I do want to thank R Street for pulling this panel together. It's a fascinating topic. It's a fascinating subject that I've been working in for a while. 
Uh, thanks to my fellow panelists, Jess and Brandon, and to Eric for those great opening remarks. Um, as Sam said, my name is Sam Kaplan, and I'm currently the Assistant General Counsel for Public Policy at Palo Alto Networks. Uh, previous to my time at Palo Alto Networks, I was leading one of the product policy teams at Meta, and I was uh, dedicated to product policy on the Facebook newsfeed and the news tab. Um, prior to my stint in the private sector, I was with the federal government for 15 years. I started out at the Department of Justice to include a stint down at the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office in Alexandria doing gang, guns, and drugs cases. Uh, I did a tour at the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, where I worked a lot on these issues regarding privacy and national security. I joined the P-Club uh, right after they published their reports uh, back in 2010-2011 on the 215 and 702 report. So that's shows how long in the tooth I am in some of these issues. Um, I also, my last stint in the federal government, I was at the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, I started out at DHS as the department's chief privacy officer. And my last role at DHS, I was the assistant secretary for cyber infrastructure risk and resilience policy, uh, where I helped manage the policy portfolio across the cyber uh, realm, not just with regard to cybersecurity, but cyber issues in general, of which sort of data and uh, uh, information and trans uh, border data flows was part of my portfolio. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Jess, what about you? So as, as Sam uh, also pointed out, uh, none of this is in my professional capacity. This is all here in my personal capacity. I feel the need to reiterate that. Um, and, and also, thank you. This is going to be a really great discussion. I'm really, really looking forward to it. So I'm the, uh, the Digital Force Protection Research Team Lead at the Army Cyber Institute up here at West Point. And I've been in this space for not, you know, for about five years. Um, this started when I, you know, started reading um, Chris Wiley's book. Um, uh, I apologize for swearing. It's literally the title of the book, Chris Wiley's book, Mindfuck. And I was really unsettled by, you know, the, the allegations in that book of what does the, all of this targeting and surveillance do um, and, and what's enabled by this, right? And there hasn't been a ton of research that's dug into this um, in a lot of ways. Like what actually, you know, are we able to do with all of this targeting? And the more I started knocking on doors around different, different um, government offices, I'm trying to raise this up and everybody's like, yeah, 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 it's not the issue, right? We're worried about critical infrastructure, we're worried about all this other stuff. Who's protecting the people? Um, and so what I have found is, is really that there's, there's a major gap in authorities and, um, you know, really trying to, to get both, you know, the, the law changed, but also overcome kind of the two big, you know, the big myths here, right? So I'm a sociologist, right? So it's never just about the data. It's more about what's in the data and why is the data what it is. Um, and the two big myths in this space are that they already have everything. So why bother? And if you have nothing to hide, you know, what are you worried about? And those are very, you know, those are two very deliberately um, structured myths to enable sort of this sense of complacency about all of this data collection. And so I come at this from a, you know, from a force protection perspective, not just that we need to protect the military from this space, but we need to protect everyone from this space, because I'm not convinced that democracy can survive in a completely surveilled society. And with that fun note, let's have a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Uh, and, and Brandon, I know you already introduced yourself at the top. I want to make sure we didn't miss anything in your, your intro or anything like that no, before I, I skip over you. Yeah. No, no, it's fine. I, I guess the, the only thing I'd say is like uh, the benefit of being a think tank is I get to speak in my official capacity. And like that's what I'm paid to do is research and write about these things. Um, um, one of the coolest jobs. But uh, yeah, I, I'd say at our street, it's, many of us know uh, that are, are watching like a, a comprehensive privacy law has been a passion of ours for a while. And we see that being important because of the benefit to consumers, industry. But I think what separates us from a little, some other think tanks is really the benefit to security. We think there's a strong nexus between privacy and security. Obviously, nuances between the two, but it's hard to separate them. But I would say we don't work together on a regular basis, but I'm also fortunate to be a non-resident fellow at the Army Cyber Institute at a on a different team. Uh, a shameless plug there, and we'll probably get to it later, but they did a, a really neat report recently called Micro-Targeting Unmasked uh, in conjunction with the Secret Service, really looking at some of these threats to high-valued individuals, uh, whether that be elected officials um, or even political candidates and members of the military. So super neat report if you haven't looked at it. Awesome. Um, perfect. Well, I, I think you all were kind of touching on my, my first question, which is admittedly more of a level set, right? I would love to hear a bit more about just how vast commercial da data collection has gotten. Uh, I think for many people, uh, it's pretty easy to understand, oh, the photo I uploaded onto Facebook, Instagram, um, 
Twitter slash X or any other social media platform, sure, it's collected, stored, it's seen, not it, maybe it's not as private anymore. Um, but as many of us all know, it, it goes a bit further than that. How much has has uh, commercial data collection changed and probably grown in the last few years and, and things like that? Who do you want to? Who, who do you want to chime in first? <laughs> if you want to start, Jess, let's do it. <laughs> I mean, I'll always start. Um, I mean, I think we're not really people aren't really aware of the vast majority of things that are out there, right? You think that your medication stuff is protected because it's covered by HIPAA. Well, HIPAA, HIPAA is not a privacy law; it's a portability law. And so I've been downloading all of my data from the different data brokers, trying to see like, well, what do they have on me, right? Um, and I have found medications in there that I don't take. Um, and furthermore, how did they get any medications in my commercial data? Because I'm military and all of that should be inside of the DOD bubble, right? Um, they have information in there about my marital status. That's not accurate, right? Um, so, you know, when we really think about everything, it's not about, you know, there's this, I'm going to super nerd out, right? There's a sociological theory about, uh, uh, by Irvin Goffman called the presentation of self, right? And the theory is, is that we present different versions of ourselves to different audiences, right? Like you're one way with your, your, with your spouse, you're another way with your coworkers, you're another way with, you know, with friends, et cetera. What we see in the data collection world now is the, the merging of all of those things, right? Um, Zuckerberg famously said, you know, oh, people shouldn't have different facets of their identity. That's not honest. Well, that's not how people work, right? He fundamentally maybe should have finished college because like he, he might have taken a class to, you know, inform him. That's not how people actually are. So the, all of this data collection, right? You think about you've got this piece of data over here, like, you know, here's the church that you go to. Here's the alcohol that you like. Here's the gun range that you go to, right? Here's the, you know, the, 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 the guilty pleasure that you like to read that nobody knows about, right? Now all of that can be merged together and it can create a very different picture about your life um, in a way that people are probably not going to be very comfortable with. Um, and, you know, again, this idea that you, if you have nothing to hide, well, every, you know, the context is the thing that makes the meaning, right? Um, you know, there's, there's a quote, it turns out it's from um, someone that was running the Polish Secret Service in Eastern Europe, but it was, you know, if you show me the man, I'll show you the crime, right? All of this data means that if people start digging, they can find something. They can go back and find 15 year old tweets, right? That, you know, and you may have completely changed your mind about something. And it was a joke in this context, you know, 15 years ago. Maybe it was still inappropriate, but now it gets blown up on the global stage. So I don't think people are really aware of, of all of the data that's going on. Um, I don't think people um, would consent if they knew, but also had the ability to meaningfully consent, because that's the other thing. Oh, well, we, 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 we voluntarily participate in this. You don't have a choice. Even if you don't have a Facebook account, Facebook is collecting data about you, right? With shadow profiles, at least based on open source reporting. That's what we, we think, right? If these algorithms, if these, these trackers are on the website, that website is collecting data about you. And those trackers are phoning home to the platform. So even though I don't have a TikTok account, if there's a TikTok tracker on any of these websites, they're gathering information about me. Right. So, you know, if this isn't something that 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 people are really aware of the depth of it and, you know, everything changes the minute you realize that that someone's looking. Right. Um, it's like when you have a cop behind you in the car. Right. And you're driving. You might be doing nothing wrong, but all of a sudden everybody gets nervous. Right. Like it's it's sort of the same thing. Right. Yeah. Totally. Totally. Yes, yeah, Sam, I don't know if you have something to add. I see you gearing up to talk. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I think Jess is exactly right. I think I've always tended to think of this, especially through my stints in, in government and, you know, at, at the private sector is sort of looking at that digital sort of breadcrumb trail that folks leave behind and how easy it is for them to sort of pick up the disparate pieces, not only on the likes and interests that, that Jess was able to highlight, but there's real, you know, some tactical details in there that really start to construct patterns of life. When you start getting to other sort of categories of sensitive information um, that they're talking about, I mean, it's, you know, how are you connecting to certain websites? Like what types of devices are you using? Do you browse early in the morning? Do you browse late in the afternoon? Do you take an afternoon break to from your work computer to look up stuff? It can include like stuff about where your kids are going to school and interest after school activities. And I think as you're sort of constructing and looking at this pattern of life, there's really, this is an old sort of analogy in the privacy space, but they're individual tiles in that overall mosaic. And I think when you really start to piece it together, as, as Jess was saying, like there are, you know, faces that we put out there that we present to employers, that we present to our family, 
that we don't present to anybody. And they really can, you know, sort of construct a 360 degree view of individuals and how they interact and look for sort of touch points and vulnerabilities and, you know, ways to exploit personality traits or interests. And I think that is one of the critical important things about this. And I think, you know, from a regulatory standpoint, that's where we have seen, you know, privacy regulations, both, you know, proposed legislation domestically, but across the globe start to bucketize different types of information, you know, health information, sensitive data um, with different types of restrictions. But even with those restrictions and in individual buckets, they're still based upon the amount of information that's out there. There's vast stores of data that's readily and most of it's publicly available um, as well. So I, that's sort of where I've been looking at this from. Yeah, I agree. I, I have two thoughts. One is it is unfortunate how many Americans, as well as just everybody around the world, are not really thinking about the amount of data that's collected on them and how it's being used. The number of times we've just clicked through a privacy policy just to get to our website is astonishing. I'll admit, even as an attorney, I used to read them. I, I guess this shows I don't do a lot that's fun in life, but now I don't read them. Um, so I think that's unfortunate. But I, I do want to follow on something Eric said in his keynote. He flagged the annual threat assessment of the intelligence community, as yeah. well as the national cybersecurity strategy, thrilled that both of them actually uh, fleshed out this, this issue, really showing that data, and this is my personal opinion too, data itself is not inherently bad. We need it for industry. We need it for the economy and innovation. Let's look at AI. AI, AI needs data. It's how it can be misused. And I think what both of those reports did well was show how, like, even as one example, China has it as a mission of theirs to vacuum up as much data as they can and use it against Americans as well as their allies, whether it be for espionage, cyber attacks, uh, and so on. I think it's, you know, I was thrilled to see in the national cybersecurity strategy um, in terms of acting on a comprehensive law. Unfortunately, that didn't make it into the implementation plan, which I know is a little in the weeds, but essentially that was the next steps and how we're going to accomplish this vision. But at least the issue was teed up and to make this a little more mainstream because this isn't some theoretical, like this is happening now and it really impacts all of us in this panel as well as anybody listening. I, I, I wanna just follow up on that if I could. Um, so, you know, you, you and this is, a, this is a common thing that comes up, right? We just click through the privacy policies. I was at a, at a car dealership getting my car worked on and I went and, you know, chatted up with a salesman. I was like, could, if I wanted to buy a new car, could I order one without all of this tech in it? And he said, no, I was like, I couldn't special order one. He said, no, right? So we don't even know that, and there's no opt-in for your vehicle tracking you, right? All of the telemetry data coming off of your vehicles, right? Most of our auto manufacturers are foreign owned companies, right? So, and then there was an article last week about Walmart looking at user, uh, you know, people that they have, I would assume their pharmacy data for people that are using Ozampic and looking at seeing how that's impacting their shopping prices. Nobody consented to that, right? So when we think about this space, right? Like we really have to, you know, not just think about what data is allowed to be collected, but what are they allowed to do with it after they collect it, right? These third party things that happen, right? Walmart probably owns the, you know, has the HIPAA data, but if they are doing that, if the reporting is accurate, they have moved either consumer data into a HIPAA enclave or moved HIPAA data into a consumer enclave, both of which are problematic, right? So I, I get a little passionate about this because it's like, we think that we have more control in the space than we really do. And it's really, really difficult that we, we, I mean, we have to really keep reiterating to folks like you can't not be tracked in this space. There is no way to do this short of going completely off grid. And then you look like a criminal. So it's, <laughs> it's, it, I, I think it's super, super important that we really hit or, you know, continue to reiterate that this is not something most people can control. Sam? Uh, well, and I think Jess brings up a really great point. We look at this in sort of the cybersecurity realm. We oftentimes refer to it as like an attack surface that as you get more and more like connected devices, your, your total surface where there's vulnerabilities and for and vectors for attack. I, I think that concept is similar in the data environment where we are increasingly relying on connected tools, connected applications, the car example, um, kids toys. Um, I, I have two young kids and I can't tell you how many of the toys are all have connected capabilities. And again, when you think about attack surface and sort of the privacy context, think of it as a data surface. It is increasing exponentially with every new type of capability that you bring online and the type of data that is subsequently available. And when you think about vulnerabilities from a cybersecurity perspective, you brought up the Walmart example, those organizations, even if you have like a 
a, a value club member card where they're tracking sort of your purchases. That type of information, you don't know where a threat actor can make strategic or tactical advantages of it, but all of a sudden it's a amount of data that's well beyond sort of your purview to be able to secure. You're really relying on the security posture of the ecosystem. So the Walmarts of the world, the CVSs of the world, Toyota for your car to rely on sort of the efficacy and the protection of that data. Because again, it's all those pieces that sort of go into that mosaic. And a lot of us don't have visibility into where this is all going. Totally, totally. And I, and I think that point brings us really nicely into our next question, which is, I find that in conversations, <clears throat> even in reporting, right, you have those who cover privacy, what data is collected, how does it feel surveillance, um, you know, how are brokers selling it to one another, selling it to various entities, and then you have those who cover cybersecurity or focus on cybersecurity, how are threat actors targeting companies for this data, all that stuff. It, for whatever reason, these conversations are siloed. I would love to bridge them together a bit more and, and hear just a, a bit more about the risk and the cybersecurity, um, I guess just the cybersecurity risks that are associated with this vast data collection that we just outlined, right? How has that threat changed? Um, I have a feeling it's not going to be a, a good answer, <laughs> but um, I don't know. We can start with, with you, Sam. Sure. Um, so I, I tend to bucket these in bridging those two conversations because I have been spanning the world of privacy and cybersecurity. Yeah. Privacy by trade, I work in cybersecurity now. I, I tend to th think of these in almost two sort of buckets. There's sort of tactical, when we were talking about that pattern of life type information that that is available, likes, interests, when and where you browse. Um, that is the type of information that threat actors can use. And very tactically, like even for ransomware, when they're you know, constructing phishing campaigns. There's the the spear phishing campaigns um, where they can really start to construct really specific vectors to be able to get you to click on, you know, a malicious link um, to compromise the system. You know, they'll the, tactically, if they know that you communicate over text message more, they can do sort of the smishing campaigns that are getting big now. So these, th this pattern of life information and that mosaic that they can construct very tactically, it can sort of give those individuals advantage. And you could have, you know, the best trained workforce, the best, you know, individual cybersecurity posture to not click. And it's it's really one moment of vulnerability that it's all it takes to sort of compromise the system, your house's system, whatever it may be. So I think there's there's sort of a tactical layer to it. And then, you know, as, as looping back to Eric's opening too, yeah. and the refer to the annual threat assessment um, from the DNI, I think the DNI really makes it clear that there is a strategic advantage and there are you know, nation states out there that see strategic advantage in collecting as much information as possible. Um, I, I mean, in, in that assessment, they're saying, you know, the accumulation and the analysis of massive amounts of information are revolutionizing science and engineering, and they view the collection of this data as a strategic advantage. I, I take that to say they might not see the strategic utility of it now, but down the road, four and five years from now, maybe even longer, they could make use of that type of information, even if there's not the technology to do sort of the big data analytics. As long as you have the stores of information, the technology will eventually catch up. So I think there's a strategic point to it. And I do try to bucket those at both the tactical and the strategic level in the long term from a cybersecurity and privacy. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, you know, as, as we think about this, this problem space, right, you know, there's always the, the use of the analogy. And, you know, the analogy of the public square, the analogy of, of you know, public records, right, like, well, I shared this photo. Um, and I think we did this 20 years ago with Napster, right, where the courts basically said, the, the physical act of sharing a, a CD is not the same as physically uploading a copy to the internet for everybody else to use. Right. But I think as, as we're thinking about this, this, this space between, you know, cybersecurity and, and privacy, right, like just because I can reach out and touch something, you know, and I have to drive there to do it, so can anybody else. Right. So we really need to start thinking back about what does something mean to be when we say something is public. Right. What does that mean? Because I don't think that public means global. 
right? And that's that's really what we end up tying to when we see all of these problem spaces, right? Like we should know who lives in our neighborhoods. We should have public records and all of these things, right? It's a different ball game if you're dealing with, you know, angry people at the court or, you know, at the town office versus the entire world yelling at you, right? It fundamentally changes the nature of the problem space. And and the the always on connected things, right? If it's connected, it's vulnerable. This was the big lesson from Andy Greenberg's book, um, Sandworm, right? Where- yep. You know, Ukraine has had a real good test run of they keep things mechanical because they can drive someone out and restart the system as opposed to trying to, like, fix the computer on the fly. So, you know, we we forget that, you know, sometimes the best security is not to have it connected to the Internet. Right. It doesn't need to talk to the Internet um, and and everything as a service and all of these software defined you know, things like, sure, it might be better in the long run, but. You know, there's real value to knowing how to do things, you know, analog, because if everybody's digital and you're analog, you have an advantage now in a lot of ways. Right. It's it's the Battlestar Galactica argument. Right. I mean, that was 20 years ago. We forget about that. But that was a really powerful argument of like this ship survived and this crew survived because they were not connected. I, I think we have to remember that. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with with Sam and Jess. Uh, I guess I'd add a couple of things. I, first, I'm often a, a, always asked, I lead a cyber team, a cyber policy team. People are like, why, how do you have privacy? I actually feel that question almost weekly. They're like, isn't that more of a tech issue? So Sam, I 100% relate <laughs> to your, your initial premise. Um, the way I look at it is like, yes, it's important for individuals to have rights and know how their data is being used, like the right to access, the, the right to delete your data, your data. Equally as important as how we secure that data. And I think that's really the missing part is we don't really have a baseline level of security. If you're in a regulated industry in the United States, yes, like in uh, healthcare to a degree and finance, but there's no blanket requirement to protect this often super sensitive uh, information, regardless of, of what it may be. And then relatedly, I do think it's often cyber means that are leading to privacy issues. So for instance, no doubt, there's no you know, doubting that a lot of our recent breaches recently have resulted in massive privacy implications. Just look in the last couple of weeks, like between 23 and me with genetic and, and uh, DNA. And then like just yesterday, the DC Board of Elections got significantly worse. We thought it was a small sample. And now it looks like everybody's voting records and affiliations are potentially implicated. You know, the exact scope of that is it's to be determined. But like that's even to Jess's uh, an initial point. Like knowing how like how people are they're registered to vote, like their addresses, the more information you start getting on these individuals, especially given the the specific individuals that live in the DC region, that can have massive implications. Absolutely, right? And um I, I'm getting ahead of myself, but it, it reminds me a, a lot of this is state by state, right? There are some states where those voting records are pretty public and I used to live in North Carolina. It's so easy to just look people up and, and figure out their affiliations, their address, et cetera. And DC, of course, there are different implications. So um, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I promise I'll circle back to the regulatory piece here in a few minutes. But before before I jump ahead too far, I, I do want to make sure maybe hearkening back to Eric's keynote, right? And the, the, the fear that cybersecurity is too theoretical, too analytical. Um, we have this insane vocabulary that's so technical that makes people's eyes glaze over and they don't understand it. They don't want to read those terms and conditions. Um, maybe to, to help with that, I don't know if anyone on the panel has a, a real life example that maybe we can walk through, right, that um, helps to illuminate some of those risks that we just highlighted right now. Um, it, anything that I, there are maybe recent incidents that include, uh, you know, a threat actor is targeting a company and, and using key data to, I don't know, do X, Y, Z nefarious activity. I don't know if anyone has anything um, that they're able to share, willing to share. I mean, there's there's a ton of yes. reporting in this space, right? There's yeah. you know you go back and you look at what happened with Gamergate, posting people's addresses, posting their phones, yeah. following them around, you know, stalking them, right? There's the case of the the federal judge whose son was murdered by the 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 men's rights activist that showed up at her doorstep, mm -hmm. right? So um, we've got, you know, election workers having to leave their house because their addresses and phone numbers were, were, were posted online. Um, we've got, you know, ISIS has been targeting you know, family members of drone operators back here in the States, right? All of this is publicly available, right? But I, I've never heard the tiles versus mosaic before. And I absolutely love that because the, there's, there's enough, you know, there's enough data points out there for us to look at this and go, holy crap, right? The problem is, is that, you know, again, we don't have... You know, until it happens to you, right? It's 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 really theoretical. 
Um, yeah. One of the big things that's happening right now, and I, you know, I, I will speak to this. I'm very pleased with the town that I live in because they were willing to compromise. They wanted to put an, an electric meter on my on my water uh, my water thing, right? They wanted yeah. to put it in, have a transmitter on it that would automatically phone home. And I had to, you know, very carefully write multiple letters explaining why I did not want a transmitter on my house. Um, I was like, you are forcing me as a government entity to, you know, cooperate with a civilian agency. I don't want a civilian commercial tool on my house like this. And it went, we went round and round. And thankfully they, you know, they did the, the political thing, which is what we do when politics is compromise, right? They said, okay, we need to put this new one on here, but there won't be a transmitter. You're responsible for sending in the picture every couple of, I was like, done, I will do it, right? And now I need to figure out how to set it up on a Raspberry Pi to do it automatically so I don't forget. But like, that's, that's information that I can control, right? The problem in this space is that this is so complicated and so like robust. Like we don't even understand the full scope scope of it right um and 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 again at least like i care about this and my kids are tired of hearing about it and my husband's tired like everybody is tired of traveling with me or even going to the store to ask for you know is there a you know can we have your phone number and the kids are like oh god right and you know so this is i care about this and i can't get headway on this right and then the other piece to this too is there's this really great paper um i forget um but they were basically talking about when you have are incentivized to reveal your information, then everybody else is also incentivized to reveal their information because not revealing implies something that you wanna hide, right? So we're talking about in this space right now, we're talking about you know everybody sort of wanting to conceal, but what happens when we incentivize the rewarding of release of information? And then that compels everyone else to release even if they didn't want to, right? Yeah, and just to add on to that, maybe not to give some military examples here, but um, Jess and I actually wrote in the first one together maybe a year ago, boy, time, the time flies, but even looking in the Russia, Ukraine conflict, mm -hmm. um, yep. just the desire to, and you know, look, uh, people always kind of combat me. They'll say, well, it's happening on the other side too. It's just the example I'm using is, is directly one, one way, but we've seen Russia amass a lot of information on Ukrainians at, at one end, just for misinformation, and disinformation. We've seen that play out in terms of text messages saying like early on in the conflict, they'd lay down your weapons or, to try to show that Russia had huge advances and victories that they actually didn't ha in fact have. But on the opposite side, targeting those individuals for physical violence, putting out their home addresses so mercenaries could go and find them, all through open source information. This wasn't the Russian intelligence apparatus, perhaps they are acting independently. This was from information that was available online, in some cases bought by data brokers. And like, that's not just present in Russia, Ukraine. Unfortunately, we, seeing that, we see that play out now in the conflict in Israel. Like we have, Sam, I think you may have even reported on this recently, yes. <laughs> uh, but like, yeah, like I, I'm glad to see it's becoming a little more mainstream, but like social media accounts, PII, photos of like Israeli defense forces, and most recently now WhatsApp messages being targeted directly to just average citizens and political individuals within Israel because of this public information. And like, there's no telling how it can be used. That's, and that's really the concerning thing. And I have to add something. It is astonishing how many times we just voluntarily hand this over. I mean, J just gave the example of, of a meter in your house. Like, that's bad. But even if I look in the context of being in the military, like, and not speaking on behalf of the DOD, but I like military discounts occasionally. I will voluntarily sometimes give that information to save 10%. Is that the smartest thing? Probably not. But even that's the case of now you have these lists available of members of the military who just proactively gave it over. You didn't have to, you didn't have to hack me or or actually do anything advanced. I just gave you it to save five dollars, which is a, a bigger issue. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um yeah. Sam. Yeah, I I mean, just to pull it back into sort of the cybersecurity context, one of the things that I've been most fascinating, it's not with regard to public data, but it's with regard to data that's probably taken from like compromised networks and, yeah. and ransomware. I, I think this is a trend um, that, that we have seen, even with the takedown from the Department of Justice of the Hive Network, um, where they were using their sort of foothold to compromise data and then doing this sort of double extortion technique where they were extorting to unlock the system, but then recognizing the tactical value of the sensitive data that was compromised across that and then putting a monetary value and in some cases still releasing information on top of that to sort of subsequently take the extortion down. So there's like layers of public data and then the amount of compromised data from the ransomware networks and you know the, those threat actors, the criminal organizations, the one that are associated with 
nation states. I mean, the the troves and layers. It's that it's that iceberg analysis that you start to pick underneath there, and and, and again the amount of data. But I, I think you know to me the real TLDR in those circumstances is like these threat actors who really recognize the value are starting to make use of the value of this data and use that to further compromise and gain a foothold for both that tactical and strategic piece that I was talking about. Totally, totally. Or even get ransomware actors who just skip the encryption altogether, right? And just go for selling the data or uh, trying to get a ransom to protect the data, whether or not they will or won't whole other bag of worms that uh it's a separate okay. panel probably but uh it's really it's really interesting to see um just the nefarious actors realize the the value of the data that's collected i i am curious to hear a little bit more about the the flip side right which is you know what challenges organizations are facing when they're determining um how much to collect and also how to better protect this information right um i i i don't think um your Walmarts or even uh, your your local grocery store is, is openly going, oh yeah, I would love to leak all this data to a, a nefarious actor or create privacy complications. Um, and, and I guess I'm curious to hear a little bit more about those challenges, right? In, in terms of why it is that it feels like organizations are collecting so much, what, what they're up against and determining what to collect, what, what not. I recognize that none of us are executives, so might be a bit <laughs> of a skewed per perspective here, but yeah. I mean, we see this, we see this in the auto industry, right? Um, yeah. And because the, they're the ones that are, just, they're, they're auto manufacturers and now they're like trying to hoover up everything that they can. And they're not thinking through what they're hoovering up. They're just trying to get everything that they possibly can. And there's no real requirements or limitations on what they can collect. Yep. Right. So, I mean, basically it's become a free for all of everyone needs to collect as much as they possibly can forever and ever. Amen. And there's only certain data types that are restricted. So they're not thinking through this in, in a lot of ways. And then you see those catchphrases of like, well, industry standard privacy practices. Well, okay, that means nothing because there's very little privacy requirements on, except on very specific things. So, I mean, I think right now the biggest problem is that everyone's collecting everything they possibly can and not thinking through how can this be misused? Yeah. I mean, to loop in sort of a regulatory discussion on top of that, certain governments around the world I've seen have been sort of making efforts to think about the data economy at large to include like the Delete Act, for example, out of California, but there's been other examples, the Data Act in the European Union, other privacy regs have, you know, tried to make attempts to sort of expand the scope and purview of the data that is protected. Um, I, I think those are beneficial. And in some of those regulatory spaces, there are, you know, they're, they're not, tactical sort of security mandates that they can sort of pivot off of but there is always sort of a reference that's you know going to call for further you know regulatory rulemaking processes to implement security best practices with regard to data so i think those the the, the scope is expanding i do think the flip side of that and those types of regulatory for cybersecurity companies companies that are in the security space there is also a tactical advantage to that data. There is a benefit to that data to protect the ecosystems and, and the societies. And, you know, this gets back to sort of what Jess was talking about when, when you start looking at subsequent uses. This is what makes sort of the data problem so vexing is it is absolutely like a, a big threat vector, especially for the average citizenry. But for those companies, organizations like Eric and CISA, um, the data is really their lifeblood. Cybersecurity at the end of the day is ultimately a data problem. Like how do we get the data and how do we use the tools to be able to make sense of that data, to spot the anom an anomalous behavior, to spot the weird signal that's going back to a place that it shouldn't be going back. Having that data and access to that data is critically important for, for those organizations in the government and in the cybersecurity industry to be able to make use of it. And you know, where you start to look at sort of the regulatory environments that are looking at sort of the risks involved with it. Like, I I also think we need to like really take stock of like the companies that can benefit and help, you know, protect against some of those real, you know, the legislative intent of some of these to protect the health, safety and welfare um, of the citizenry. And it's, it's it is a, a really tough needle to thread. Yeah, and Sam mentioned some of the international regulatory efforts too. Like 
quite frankly, the U.S. is behind. I mean, look at between the GDPR that's now over five years old and a lot of our peer countries have comprehensive privacy law. I mean, for, for goodness sakes, China has a privacy law. We can disagree whether it's fully followed and <laughs> in what respect the CCP actually follows it, but they have one in writing. I mean, the U.S. doesn't. I mean, granted, like not to tie everything, ever, if you know me, I can fit really the American Data Privacy Protection Act into any conversation. <laughs> but to, I, I say it sincerely because was it the perfect bill for everybody? No, but I think it would have done a lot to preserve privacy and security. I mean, even at a high level, the threshold was data minimization. So this is, I'm, I'm simplifying this drastically, but really minimizing the amount of data collection in the first place outside of a defined list of permissible purposes. And I know there was some disagreement whether that list was great or not, but as a threshold, are we over collecting data? Do we actually need what we're collecting? I, I thought that was a good approach. And then relatedly, it had an affirmative mandate to actually protect the data that is collected rather than just saying, okay, we've collected it. Now it's it's really, there's a lack of security. And third, it was putting consumers on notice of like when their data was going to select foreign countries. Right now, your data can be transferred to Iran, North Korea, and China. There's no obligation to tell the consumer that, and it's happening. At least here, there'd be an obligation. And I, I just I sing that out. There's many other legislative proposals that are getting at the same thing. All that to say, I think it is time we do something. And like some people critique their regulators, like the Federal Trade Commission, for to moving forward. I know I was one of them partially, but in the, in the the play devil's advocate, at least they're trying to do something. Although I am like drastically in a firm support that Congress should be one to act. So I think now is the time to do something. I mean, totally. I think you, bring up, you bring up a really, really good point about this, this, you know, where's your data going from foreign companies? We had some interns look at this last year and we could not find data on how many apps on Facebook were American versus foreign. But in the app ecosystem that we could find information on, on, um, you know, the Google phones and Apple phones and um, Amazon, um, there's like 64 million app companies out there and like 7,000 are U.S. based. So every time you put a foreign owned app on your phone, that data is leaving. That data is not staying here, full stop, right? Um, and then that doesn't even get into all of the, the cookies that are being used to track people across the internet, right? Now the, the, the ad ecosystem is moving to server side cookies, which means you can't opt out of it because it's not something that you control in the browser, right? So, you know, again, we're really thinking through, like if we try to push this down to the individual, nothing will happen because it's simply too much to do every day. Um, and and it, it really has to be, you know, we have to minimize the, the because we have to, you know, we're talking about the state of minim minimization and everything. But, you know, uh, Mary Ebling wrote in, in her book, Afterlives of Data, right? Data is fundamentally about power, right? It controls what is written. It controls how the story is transcribed. It is fundamentally about power. And there's never been a tool that's been invented that gives people power that hasn't been used. So when we think about all the data that's being collected, even if it's, you know, hemorrhoid wipes at Walgreens, right? Um, that can be used against you somewhere, right? That can be a tell on something else. And so we really need to start thinking through like, what do these companies really add, you know, need to be able to do their jobs, right? Advertising has existed well before the internet, right? Um, you know, what data is really needed by who? And then again, thinking about the subsequent sale of it, Right. Um, and like, I'm going to buy this company and that means that this data goes with it. Well, maybe not. Right. Um, we, we really have to start thinking about segmentation, minimization, because, again, this is too much for any individual to handle. Um, and you end up feeling really paranoid when you start you know, talking about it at parties because people are like, and you're crazy because it's so much data. Totally. Um, can you guys hear me? OK, I'm having headphone issues. Sure in 2023 uh but <laughs> basically i i'm curious then you know as we're sticking with the regulatory piece of this because we are all clamoring to talk more about that it, it does i hear this all the time from experts from companies that are dealing with this there is a patchwork of laws right that are happening on the state level um potentially the u.s federal level uh certainly the international level how has this changed uh, I, I guess two part, right? One, what are maybe the trends you're seeing in terms of regulatory interest? Where are kind of these privacy bills heading? Where have they headed? I think we were kind of hitting on that in the last question there. But uh, and then secondly, how has that changed compliance requirements, right, for for affected companies? If this is just something that's become uh, complicated to follow, if it's becoming something that's actually limiting the amount of data that we're, we're uh, looking at, limiting collection of, or, you know, what what is maybe the state of play here? 
So as a former privacy officer, I, I will like touch on sort of the patchwork thing. I think the patchwork approach, just from a sheer privacy perspective, when you're looking at compliance, where you do have sort of, you know, somewhat similar regulations or compliance requirements that are somewhat overlapping, inevitably, you're going to get differences in definitions, differences in yeah. like standards, uh, differences in, in, you know, what can be collected for what purpose, use standards, sharing usage, and where those things overlap, inevitably, there's gaps, and there's fissures in how those things are implemented. And, you know, I, I think as far as trends, as we're looking at sort of privacy regulation, you know, Brandon brought up the example of GDPR. The European Union often has first mover advantage in some of these areas. I think we're seeing it in a number of different regulatory efforts. I think some countries have been moving towards, you know, the adequacy like GDPR type approach. Um, but and again, just a personal opinion. I think, you know, some countries are looking towards, you know, GDPR type adequacy, but also taking a step back and saying, is this the type of framework is, and, you know, I'm not in any of these discussions, but they're, they're looking it's like, is consent really the most effective way? And when you talk about sort of the paralysis of people understanding, like even with the notice and clicking through the notices, like, I, I think the same type of paralysis could be, you know, there with like individualized consent. It, it almost becomes unworkable. And even if it's a privacy notice that you're clicking through, the same click-through rate with regard to, um, you know, a consent sort of rubric would, would be similar. So I think we are seeing countries, you know, Australia just published a report as they're, you know, reassessing their approach to the privacy law and they're moving closer towards, but I think, you know, they're also sort of, you know, taking a deeper dive assessment as to what type of information and how the frameworks can really be constructed. Um, I, I, I think, to layer on top of that with regard to, to the privacy, I think some of these countries also are looking at sort of very fr frankly, like the economic advantage that certain data sets and certain types of collections can have in individual jurisdictions. Um, you know, Brandon brought up the example of, of AI, like in burgeoning AI economies, like how is data being used and how can that better, you know, sort of address? So I think that's, that's one of the interesting trends. And then the other piece that I did touch on earlier is sort of looking at these frameworks that are, you know, looking beyond just personal data and starting to look at the type of information that's generated by like an IOT device, for example, um, and how we can put restrictions on that. And I think, you know, to one of Jess's points, I've seen privacy regulations also and, and data regulations also start to look at uses as opposed to like the collections. It's putting more restrictions on further uses as, as a way to sort of stem um, like the real bad effects of this. But again, it it is truly a patchwork. I, I do think strategically as we're looking, especially in the international data transfer regimen, the you know, the negotiation of the EU US data privacy framework and coming up with these sort of broader cross national schemes. I think we're seeing the same in sort of the cross border privacy rules out of APAC that countries are looking to sort of self certifications. I think those are big advantages and they're addressing some of this patchwork framing that, that, that we're seeing and getting more universal understanding on what we're trying to protect and the reason we're trying to protect it. Totally. Yeah, it's, a, it's okay. a quick, uh, Jeff, you want to go first? Or uh, yeah, it's a quick follow up. I would say, at least in the US, I, I'm sure some people disagree. I have rarely met a member of Congress that does not want to act in comprehensive privacy legislation. I think a lot of people see the need for it. I think the downside is we get bog, you know, bogged down into like some of the political differences in terms of like, how are we going to handle some of the mechanics within that? Because I, I, I know it's easy to say like, we all want it but how are we going to achieve it? And I think that's really where like compromises need to come into play. Like it, it's not going to be the perfect bill for everybody because that's just unobtainable. Uh, I do think it's a matter of like realizing the necessity behind it. Like as today's argument, uh, uh, you know, discussion is, is shown and really by default, absent a U.S. standard, companies have to follow like the existing standards, like the GDPR. And that's not an American framework. I think there's benefits to it, but there's just as many cons to it that have like hamstrung U.S. businesses. And not to mention, 
to Sam's point on the patchwork, fully agree. I mean, it's a it's a burden for large businesses, let alone our small and medium sized businesses to have to keep up with this evolving patchwork. My team and I do this for, for a living and we struggle to follow all the developments even at the state level. Depending on how you wanna qualify a comprehensive privacy law, we're gonna have anywhere from 12, likely 13 we can go with, that's common. Sometimes people even put more in them of state standalone framework for the end of the year. And there's def definitely similarities, but there's just as many differences. Following that and trying to comply is a nightmare. But I think even a worst case scenario is you're like me living in New Jersey. I don't have a data privacy law in New Jersey. So therefore, there's really no parameters outside of good faith companies that want to protect my data. Outside of that, there's nothing wrong with buying and selling and transferring my data, um, as bad as that sounds. I mean, I think that's a really, really good point. Like a lot of the things that come up in this space is about government access to data. Like everybody's like, oh my God, the NSA is collecting everything. How could they, right? I'm not worried about governments in this space, right? The problem is, is that the, you know these capabilities that used to exist at the nation state level have been basically dropped down to anybody with you know a computer, right? There is voter registration information on 16,000 service members that is publicly available to go scrape and copy off the internet right now addresses and names of people and, vo and their voter affiliation, if the state reveals it, of people that live on military installations, all you have to do is copy and paste that and you can upload it to Google and Facebook and start targeting those people for ads, right? And that can be for political manipulation, that can be for mis and disinformation, that can be for, you know, making people less willing to, you know, engage in, in democracy. Like you can, like, this is for anyone that has the ability to do this. This is not expensive. Right. And again, that that is there. Right. I can show you the website. I'm not going to say it, but it's there. Right. Because it's voter security. Um, again, this question of why, you know, public versus does not mean global. And and we've got to think about limiting the blast radius of all of this. And people really need to understand what does it mean to have someone's name and email address? You can upload it to some of these ad platforms and start targeting information. Right. Um, we look and, and you, it doesn't even have to be a person. Right. Our, our sons right now, our teenage sons are being algorithmically targeted by, you know, by algorithms to get them to stay online and sending them content about Andrew Tate, who is a horribly misogynistic, like like just absolute creep and you know borderline criminal there's no one necessarily behind that except for the companies that are making the algorithms to keep the you know the boys online so when we really think about this right there's yeah there's the government aspect and we don't want the government to have access to these things but really the problem that i see is that so much data is available to anyone with a computer right now and that's really the problem space is you know if you end up making the news right you become the character of the day and 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 your life can be completely ruined forever for one tweet, right? Um, that's really the, the challenge here, right? And, and if you're an activist, God forbid, right? Um, if you have taken a stand in the current conflict, you know, they'll follow you forever and ever, amen, right? For better or for worse, right? And, and, and I mean, this is again, what is the blast radius of a tweet? But all of this data that's being collected, we're not just talking about, you know, big companies, small companies, you know, state or local governments. We're talking about anyone with a credit card, anyone with a computer can get access to this and use it to commit real harm. And so, again, thinking about this attack surface, we, we, we've got to think about minimizing the actual data at all, because if, you know, the wrong person gets it, and I'm talking person, right, like down to the individuals, that's the thing that scares me the most is if you have like one person out there that's like super obsessed with you, right, you're going to have a real bad time um, because they can find all of this information about you, where you live, where your family members live, all of that, right, that's all easily available. And so, you know, again, thinking of, I appreciate the conversation about the regulatory environment because I think it's super, super important, but we also have to think about minimizing just the broader collection because I, I, as I said in the opening, I am not sure that democracy can survive if anyone with a computer can start threatening people and making them not want to participate and do this thing called democracy. Totally, totally. No, um, yeah, thank you for bringing that point up. Um, I have maybe one or two more questions that are going to be related to that um, before I turn it to the audience. So just one last call. If you have any Q&A, there are like a good number of questions percolating already. But if anyone has any other questions, be sure to submit them to the Q&A. There should be a function at the bottom. Zoom, we're all used to it by now. Uh, but I, I do wonder, you know, when it comes to if you I, I'm curious to hear from this panel, if 
um, you were speaking with a regulator or a congressional staff. Uh, I wonder, there might be people watching that right now uh, <laughs> who, who are thinking through this issue, right? I feel like, especially on Capitol Hill, the conversation has been, how do we get a federal privacy bill through? What do we include in it? Uh, do we segment off kid safety? Do we preempt the state bills? Like it's been a, a real doozy of uh, the last few years going through this this roller coaster. Um, you know, how do you what 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 would you like to see regulators and policymakers doing in this space? Is the solution the federal data privacy bill that we all have been dreaming of for the last uh, five, 10, uh, however many years really at this point, or is it something else? So not coming at this from having written legislation perspective, yeah. just sort of my wish list. Yep. Um, I want to see devices that exist that are not connected to the internet. I want to be able to buy a car that doesn't come connected to the internet, right? So make it a requirement that you can meaningfully opt out of this at the manufacturing level. Um, I want to see, you know, I, I want to see people be able to meaningfully get out of this and then have it be enforced. Um, we haven't even touched on the biometric aspect of all of this and all of the companies that are taking your biometric data and, and all of that. Right. So we are just at the tip of the iceberg of this problem space. And as we think about passing you know, legislation, I would ask Congress to really think through, like, what is the worst case scenario? Look at the ways that data has been used both in the past and is currently being used by repressive regimes around the world. How do we carve out data protections and privacy that preserves and protects democracy? Because that is really the key to this, right? Is we've, we've seen all of these you know, countries that have these mass amounts of data collection, they're not doing really great things with it some right so really think through and be creative about how bad this stuff could get um and and try to lean over the horizon to think about reining this stuff in yeah i guess from my perspective just a level set because i know I, i'm in dc so i like i like to think through a dc bubble sometimes but like just to really make this simple i kind of see four buckets of legislation on the hill and how this can proceed one is like kid specific legislation. That's where I see the Senate hyper focus. Like let's pass a bill that is just geared toward kids online safety. That may be privacy and be broader. Um, second is like some of these niche bills that touch on privacy, but are not comprehensive. Like a bill just at IOT, a bill just on biometrics, a bill just on like uh, exporting data abroad or like centralized deletion programs. Third is the new one emerging is like AI. Should AI independently address privacy or should AI be part of a privacy bill? And then fourth is like a comprehensive privacy bill that, that really is around rights of individuals, collecting and selling data, and has a host of other uh, measures underneath it. That's a, in the ideal world, I think that is the first step. Before we can talk about regulating AI or what that may look like, I think acting on privacy is the fundamental first step. And I realize like, my ideal bill would not look like every member of Congress would would ultimately want, but I think that is really like every piece of legislation. It is a give and take. The fact that like we're bogged down the weeds between like a private right of action. So should an individual be able to sue for a violation and preemption? They're big issues, but at some point we do need to move ahead, I think. And I think that's where like some of the efforts last Congress did make a really solid attempt to try to thread that needle, realizing we can't make everybody happy, but on behalf of all Americans, it's time we do something. So that's, if I was the sole member of Congress today, that's what I'd be working on is, is, is crafting a comprehensive bill. And then let's get to the, some of these other areas. Oh, Sam, I think you're muted. Sorry, we had a, a lawnmower behind us. <laughs> I didn't want to disrupt. <laughs> um, but to pivot off of, Brandon's comment. I think getting started there probably makes sense. The devil's naturally going to be in the details on what a federal comprehensive law looks like. I, I do sort of note the, the trends, especially domestically, to try to address privacy through other areas that might have sort of more political inertia behind them. Like AI, I think, is we're, we're seeing that both domestically, but also internationally using sort of restrictions and you know frameworks on AI to get at the privacy problem. Um, but to me, like privacy and, and AI regulation can nest with one another. And I, I think, you know, first and foremost, you just, you got to get started somewhere and be very clear about the particular problem set that you're trying to address. If you're looking at consumer privacy, let's tackle consumer privacy. And you can start, you know, hanging pieces on the Christmas tree when it comes to biometrics um, but again, you know, when I was talking about sort of the, the piecemeal patchwork approach, I think we're looking at, you know, something that just addresses 
you know, biometric collection versus geolocation versus data, you know, again, you're going to start looking at different definitions and, you know, we, we need to sort of set some fundamentals. So we're all singing from the same sheet of music. Like what is the definition of personal information? Well, what is the definition of, you know, sensitive personal information? What is the definition of kids information? Because small differences in sort of definitions can have huge collateral consequences as you're coming down the road. The technology advances so quickly that it adjusts to regulatory definitions. So again, like getting started and, you know, getting good definitions in, in place, I think is going to be critically important to at least making some progress. Totally. Totally. And I, I think with that, um, I'm going to turn it to the the audience questions that we've gotten, and then I'll, I'll have one more at the end to, to kind of close us out. But um, the, the first one is just related to what we were just talking about. Um, I, how do you expect the U.S. presidential election next year to to affect the discussions and ongoing debate around uh, federal data privacy legislation? Um, I would have to imagine it's going to be low on the priority list, but I, I'm not the expert on this panel. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I'll take that. <laughs> that's, that's a tough question. <laughs> but, Not touching that one. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm never shy to talk to talk uh, about politics necessarily either. That's the nice thing about not being on active duty. So, yep. um, yeah, I, I would say, look, to the, to credit of this administration, I have seen them reflect and put a priority on privacy. I don't always see, or maybe not 100% and in sync always in terms of some of the smaller details, but like the president has put in his last two State of the Union addresses the need for privacy. Matter of fact, the most recent one, it was even beyond just kids' privacy. Then the fact that his Office of National Cyber Director also touched on privacy in a cyber strategy is really good. And I think we see that a, a, across a number of agencies too. So I think there is strong support for that. Uh, I think there's still like super strong support among Congress too, but of, of both parties. Um, I do think what would be most helpful, though, is really just seeing this elevated as a as a true priority. Because I, I look, I'm, I'm a realist too. At the end of the day, Congress can only pass so many laws and only has so much committee time. So I think having an administration say like, no, this is a super strong priority. We need we need to push this from the White House and get congressional support behind it. I think would be helpful. So I mean, that's not a direct answer to the, their question, <laughs> but. I think regardless of who is president, whether it's a second Biden administration term or a new president, I'm really hoping that the privacy and data issue is front and center. And I honestly think AI is almost forcing that. I totally agree with Sam on his assessment on AI, but at least it's elevating the privacy angle. Although I do think they, uh, a privacy bill being distinct without AI is probably the best first step. Totally. I don't know if anyone else wants to touch that. If not, I can go to a friendlier topic. <laughs> I, I, the, the only thing that I'll say is I, I just, I agree with Brandon on it. For the hopes of it succeeding, it needs to be a priority. My hope is that it doesn't take a large scale incident to sort of make it a yeah. priority. Oh. And I, I think we've seen that in, in other countries, you know, for example, one that comes off the top of my head, Australia suffered like really significant data breaches of a financial system and a health system and their regulators rightly got sort of really inspired to start tackling and, and updating the privacy law. So my only hope is that it becomes a privacy because a, a, a priority because it's important, not because we're responding to some dramatic incident. Totally. Um, I, I think a lot of us agree with that dream and that hope, right? Um, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> um, but uh, the 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 next question I'll jump to is is around uh, just how you comply with all these regulations, right? I'm I'm gonna paraphrase it a bit, but uh, the the question at hand is basically pointing out that you know privacy and cybersecurity regulations to comply with them it requires a big budget. Uh, large companies might have that. Small businesses most likely will not. Um, how do you balance drafting comprehensive regulations that don't take uh, small companies out of the game? Well, I mean, I, I think it's it's a case of thinking about what like what data are we talking about, right? Like the the local bookstore is going to collect data on what I buy, right? What are they going to do with that, right? If the restriction is don't upload it to any ad tech companies and use it for marketing further, then that's easy to comply with, right? Um, if you're going to be a medical health provider, you have different rules and expectations, right? And that 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 should be the case. 
So, I mean, I think we, we, we like to, to lionize this idea of like, oh, the small businesses, the mom and pops, if there's a, mo- if there's a need for small businesses, some platform will arise that will enable people to, to meet the requirements. There was a, a book platform that would, you know, this platform sells that would help you um, compute taxes globally if you were going to sell online off of, you know, off your own platform, right? It got bought and shut down, but the platform helped you navigate this massive amount of, of regulatory requirements, right? Um, so if that there's a if there's a if there's a, a need for it, you know, someone the market will respond, yep. right? Um, so I think we we have to think really clearly about what we're trying to do, and um, we have to make sure that it is not so onerous that only the big companies can 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 comply, right? Like that's really the the thing that we're thinking that that is likely going to happen if the big companies get to influence their their the, the outcomes. They're going to make it something that only they can do, and that's a big problem. I, and and with regard to the expense and the compliance, I I, I will and again personal opinion here. I think the patchwork also is one of the things that contributes to sort of the increased compliance costs for organizations and businesses. They're going to need increasing. I mean, you look at breach notification just alone, uh, where where they're talking about you know having to respond to a breach and give notice here, where you have a patchwork of requirements for different jurisdictions like more and more expenses have to be sort of allocated to sort of tactical incident response folks. And <laughs> you're taking non-fungible resources away from responding to incidents just to meet regulatory compliance. And I think one of the things that is personally feeding into that is this multitude of laws that are patched work together yeah. right now. A hundred percent agree. And I think yeah. But they both touched on points uh, that uh, just to reflect on. I think to Jess's point, there is a huge difference between a local convenience store that is really not yeah. collecting mass amounts of data versus a small data broker that, and in some cases, there are one or two people, but they're collecting and selling information on millions of Americans. That's why I think it is important to, to Sam's point to get definitions correct. Like it's a covered entity under a privacy bill is not just a blanket term. Like we do need to thread that needle between what type of data are they collecting? How much is it? Because I don't want to see the small or medium-sized businesses have to like just see this as a compliance nightmare uh, or exercise. But if they are a small business engaged in super sensitive data in large amounts, that is different. And I think there was some of that nuance and, and many members of Congress have, have picked up on that. Um, so. Totally, totally. Um, yeah, I think that all makes a lot of sense. Uh, the next question, it's less of a question, more of a comment. I'm still interested to see if there's like any reaction or, or thoughts on this topic as well. Um, as, as someone who thinks about AI and cybersecurity quite frequently nowadays, um, the the comment is since someone mentioned that data is needed for AI, it's important to mention the cybersecurity concerns related to AI specifically, such as data poisoning, prompt inj- injections, etc. Um, these are all even less known and understood than the data collection practices that have been discussed so far. Um, I, I guess maybe if I, I can add a question to this, it would be, um, you know, how do we go about regulating for those cybersecurity concerns when it comes to AI, the data collection, when we are still trying to understand these AI models and systems to begin with? Um, I, I don't know how you regulate something that's that feels unknown. Oh, that's I got this up. one. Yeah. Um, so the problem with the AI models is that nobody knows how they work and you can't, you should not be putting anything on yep. the market if you cannot explain what it what it does, yep. right? There's billions of parameters and it's coming up with an answer. And if you can't actually recreate the answer of what it's doing, then how do you know that it's actually doing anything reasonable and et cetera, right? So these tools are incredibly irresponsible as they're currently being deployed. And the fact that it's hoovering up all of this data, they don't know what's in it, they don't know why it's coming up with the decision that it's coming up with, right? I think these things are incredibly dangerous and irresponsible, right? The best use for these models moving forward will be small scale, trained on data that we know and understand of what it is, and then you can control the privacy pieces that are going into it so that you understand and one, how it came up to the outcome that it came up with. And then two, you can you can make sure that you're, you're putting adequate protections in there. The problem right now in the AI language space of all of this is it's these giant things with massive amounts of data and no human can actually go through and, and sort through it. And that is a problem, right? That is fundamentally not going to be regulated because it's just hoovering up everything in their brother. And that's that I think is that's, it's part of the marketing hype around these things. Oh my God, they're gonna do all this cool stuff. It can't even answer two plus two anymore because they've, you know, these these large chat models, right? So everyone needs to calm down about this stuff. There's going to be some really cool things that this is going to do and they're going to be able to use, but it's going to be much more niche and industry specific, which means that we're going to be able to regulate it a lot better. 
right on. The only thing that I, I would add to that is I do think that there are frameworks that are starting out there like NIST, you know, RMF that are trying to get their, their AI risk management framework that are trying to get their arms uh, around this. I do think that there's differences and this is to sort of harken back to my earlier point regarding the importance of definitions. There's sort of a different category of risk that's associated with, you know, these tools that are vacuuming up vast amount of information, large language models versus, you know, the type of AI that's been employed that more probably associated with more traditional machine learning to look for sort of patterns. I, I do think that there is nuance across the definitions and what the what the models actually do. And, you know, regulating this again, we don't want to create unintended consequences of broadly scoped definitions or broadly scoped restrictions. And I think that's one of the trickiest things to, to sort of wrap our heads around. And the technology is just advancing, much like in the privacy space. The technology is just advancing so much faster than regulatory frameworks can sort of catch up with it. Well, yeah, I think it's really important to keep in mind, like, look, there are risks, but there are also immense benefits when it comes to AI. And I think yeah. oftentimes we instantly go to the risks and I don't want to downplay them. Those are things we should work through in like an even handed manner between privacy, security and potential bias. At the same time, too many times policy conversations leave out all the benefits to Sam's point, many of which we've been employing for over a decade. This yeah. just got the, the the buzz recently because of like generative AI, but we've all been using this, whether we know it or not, like anybody use GPS today, you used AI, you just didn't know it, or you may not have been thinking about it. But I think in, I, I come at it from a cyber angle. Yes, bad actors are going to definitely employ AI. But I, I think as a as a company or a government, if you're not looking at how you can employ it to protect yourselves, you're really behind now. I'm not saying you don't put appropriate policies and procedures in place, like to the person who asked question, like, yeah, we don't want like top secret information being, you know, without with some narrow exceptions, being put into a public model, that'd be terrible. But if we're going to use it to to better assess what is malware, to be quicker, to bring down the skill set of our defenders, like those are great use cases. So I do think it's a it's kind of a balance of both. Totally, totally. Um, and and I think I'm going to ask maybe one last question to to close this out. Uh, potentially an uplifting one. I'm not. The question's not going to sound uplifting, but I'm hoping the answers will be. Uh, which is a you know I I am. I'm constantly worried about kind of the uh, fatigue that people feel around this topic, right? It is so easy just to not care or um, to think, oh, well, it doesn't matter. Like, what sensitive data do I have anyway? Or, well, like, just giving my email address away just for a $5 off coupon sounds like a great deal. Um, and, and at the same time, I think we're just talking a lot and a lot and a lot in D.C. about federal privacy without seeing maybe any action or bills being passed I, I guess maybe bringing it back to to Sam's hopes and dreams earlier, um, not mine, but the Sam on the panel, uh, which is, you know, how do we kind of spur interest without there being a catastrophic event? Because I, I think too often that that is the thing that gets DC moving. Um, I don't know how else we go about raising awareness, getting people excited and moving on this topic without there being like another major breach or another Cambridge Analytica or or something of that nature, yeah. I, I mean, the incentive model right now is wrong, right? Because yeah. even though everyone wants to pass the legislation, every congressperson is gonna use some models to run their reelection campaigns and it's gonna be based on some of this data. So there's an, there's an incentive structure there to try to you know carve out these things that you can use, right? Um, so we've really got to figure out how do people get to do this without using all of this people data on, on people that are vulnerable, right? So I'm, I'm not the one to end on an uplifting note. I'm just going to leave that there so someone else can try to end us on a more positive note. I'll, I'll try to sort of get it to the positive. I have noticed sort of a trend where there are certain companies out there, and I'm not going to name any companies, but there are certain companies out there that are starting to recognize that privacy enabled technology is something that they can both market to and creates, you know, sort of awareness. And, you know, it's simplifying privacy controls that individuals can sort of exercise. And it's, you know, simple measures, changing something from an opt out to an opt in. Though those are really simple things that can like have real drastic 
benefits to the privacy space. And I do think that there is industry that is looking at that. There is a whole host of privacy enabled technologies. You know, it's if you go to the IAPP conference, you know, as you walk the floor there, there there's a number of these tools that are out there, again, to make it, you know, understandable, explainable, easy to use. I, I do see a burgeoning market on that front and maybe the market is filling in in some of these areas, but I do think that these are going to have continue to have sort of collateral consequences. Like I was saying that opt in, opt out where, where you can proactively opt in to sharing this information, you know, cross app information uh, for, for data trackings. Even if most people aren't going and, <laughs> And opting in, the fact that they have to opt in to enable that becomes a huge privacy protection because as Jeff was saying, like all of a sudden you're taking that, that attack surface of data and just decreasing it exponentially because people are just not going into those, those opt-in. And I think, you know, as we see more and more organizations look at those sort of privacy enabling technologies, I think, you know, we're, we're moving in the right direction. Yeah, I think kind of two quick thoughts. I think it's important to keep the attention on it, whether like you're, you're Sam and you're reporting or you're in academia or a researcher and you're an in industry, there's so many competing policy interests, like keeping the attention on like what is happening in the world and need for this is critical because if not, you know, policymakers attention are going to turn elsewhere. And like, this is something I think that should be priority prioritized and acted now. I do think relatedly though, it's like, we don't, we shouldn't have to wait for a privacy law. Like if you're in company leadership, like you should be thinking now of like, how do we embrace privacy, even if it's not a requirement? And like, it's a Sam's point, maybe that is a differentiator, but with your competitors, like market that to your customers on like how you embrace privacy and how that's different than somebody you may be competing with. Uh, maybe I'm in the minority, but I look for a company that has more privacy features when I'm going out to buy, if there are multiple types of product in that field. I think, but then also is the consumer role. I would, you should not, if you take nothing away from this, this webinar, you shouldn't have the mindset of uh, that my data is out there, like it's a lost cause. If that's the case historically, at least start now. Like I'd be aware of who I'm sharing my data with, how it's being used, questioning, do they actually need that? Do I need to get my social security number to register with my doctor apart from health insurance? Like I, I ask my doctor that every time I go and it's a fight. But so I, I think it is a matter of like as businesses and consumers, like being aware of this issue. Um, and hopefully if we, if we do a panel like this again, hopefully like we'll be reflecting on how like comprehensive privacy law is helping, but you know, uh, fingers crossed. <laughs> and from uh, your mouth to the uh, Hill's ears, maybe perhaps uh, I've been covering this for so long, who knows when we'll get a bill, <laughs> but yeah. Um... Great. Well, I I think those were all the questions I had for the panel today. Uh, I want to thank everyone for sticking with us, for participating, and uh, for having each of us uh, this afternoon. Brandon, I don't know if you have any closing remarks besides that, but... No, Sam, oh, just you. outside of thanking you. Re okay, really thank appreciate you. your time and, and the other Sam, and then also Jessica. You guys, this is I could have this conversation for hours, but I uh, <laughs> really appreciate your time. Awesome. But... All right, everybody, take care. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.